I just want to say I can validate what the sister is talking about. The enemy has been trying to attack my eyes. And I'm believing God that he's going to do a mighty work. Because yes. when the enemy comes in like a storm, God will raise up a banner. And I trust him tonight because he's my savior. He's my deliverer. And I must trust him and so do you. Amen. Amen. I just want to comment the children tonight. Jeremiah, you reminded me of my old self back in the military. I was like, wow, am I in the military? What's going on here? But that was beautiful. Y'all did a wonderful job. Wonderful job. Let's give them Amen. Amen. Wonderful. I'm also reminded that he said, we are soldiers in the army. Yes. And we have to remember that. And I always teach my husband because he's a Marine and I'm an army. So he understands that we are soldiers in the army. Amen. 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 On that note, let's get ready and pray because God gave me to do some things. Yes, and I'm excited about what he's going to do. And as my sister said, God is not finished with you yet. Right. There are some more things that he wanted to throne. And we're going to allow him to be Lord tonight. Amen? Amen. To do what he needs to do. Yes. So let's pray. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I put on the full armor of God with the belt of truth, the buckle around my waist with the blessed breastplate of righteousness in place. And with my feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition, I take up the shield of faith and I declare that I extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I declare that my God is sending angels, armies to do battle against you fallen demons. I decree in the mighty name of Jesus that you will take your hands off of our, out of this camp. It will be restored. I will not fight with the flesh and the blood, but I declare that I will fight utilizing the whole armor of God in this war, in this battle against rulers, against the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. I am more in Christ Jesus. Yes. Great is he that is in me and is he that is in the world. Amen. All of your powers are rendered ineffective. You will surrender and submit in the mighty name of Jesus and you will surrender quickly and all heaven will testify that you defeated through the power of the prayer of agreement through my Savior Jesus Christ. Let's give him a praise. Amen. I want to talk with you tonight about the spirit of self-pity. The spirit of self-pity. As my brother Randy was ministering this morning, I said, okay, God, you setting us up for something. You setting us up. And I just want to give him praise because some of the scriptures that he even mentioned is going to be applied again. So when he brings this message back twice, that means that he's up to something. He's getting ready to do something. And he wants you to receive his word tonight. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's move on. So the dictionary of self-pity, let's see what the Webster says. It says self-pity is excessive, self-absorbed unhappiness over one's own troubles. Mm. Let me read that again. Excessive self-absorbed unhappiness over one's own troubles. Self-pity is when we have pity for ourselves, especially when we have a self-indulgent attitude towards our own hardships. Something bad happens to us, and we decided to limit our loss alone. Since no one else apparently will, as the enemy have us to think, that we all are alone in this situation. Self-pity is our sinful, selfish response to something not going the way we think it should. And it's subtle sin we often don't recognize it right away because it wears the disguise of righteousness in the nation. We feel justified to indulge 
it after the justice we suffered. Even if all the all that happened when we didn't get our way. The Bible says in Matthew's 11th chapter, verse 28 through 30. That's Matthew's 11th chapter, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Hallelujah. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you're thinking of something totally contrary to what the word of God said, it's the enemy. Every one of us have been prone to self-pity. We are born self-centered with a powerful drive to protect our ego and our rights. When we decide that life has not treated us as we have the right to be treated, self-pity is the result. Self-pity causes us to disagree with God over how life and he has treated us. The Bible says in 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, verse 7 through 11, that's 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, verse 7 through 11. Casting all your care upon him. Yes, Lord. For he cares for you. Yes. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Yes. Who resists steadfast in faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who have called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Give him a hand clap all right. some examples self-pity settles in. Let's talk about some of these things. Number one, self-pity takes the bad things in our lives and brings them to the forefront of our focus. Then it tells us that nothing ever goes well with us and make these lies seem as if they are the truth. It's a setup. Mm -hmm. Number two, self-pity hides the truth from us. Mm -hmm. This is an occultic in nature because it are clues, which mean cover-ups, the truth, and change our perspective to keep our focus on the lie. Yes. Mm -hmm. Number three, and if we're going too fast, this is why Kevin M. records the service. <laughs> Number three, it seeks to establish the lie of fatalism in our lives and make us believe that nothing will ever improve. Mm -hmm. Number four, self-pity also tries to isolate us by deceiving us into thinking that we'll be safe from being hurt further if we withdraw from people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the lie of the devil. Yeah. 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 Number five, it succeeds in isolating us by using negative thoughts, feelings, and emotions to push people away. This creates a vicious cycle of pushing others away and feeling more and more rejected. So now he's working on you. He wants you to get all alone. Oh, I'm going to do this by myself. Nobody loves me. Nobody understands me. Why I went through this? Why is this happening to me? This is what he wants you to believe. Number six, it is self-sustaining. It can convince us that we don't need anyone else. That it's all about just 
us. And it's a lie. Yeah. Number seven. Self-pity blinds us to our past and does not allow us to move forward. So what does this do? It reminds you of your past and continue, and continue to keep you in bondage of your past. And it keeps you from moving forward into the things that God has for you. The next one, number nine, I think that's what it is. Eight. It takes on a victim role. Always the victim, but not interested in looking for a solution. Or in taking responsibility for one's own life, and it is unwilling to find a way out. Number nine. Self-pity can be manipulated and punishes others if they don't give in to enabling it. They want you to have a self-pity spirit of what they're going through. And if you are allowing that spirit to get you to think the way that he's thinking, you are in bondage along with that person. Because if you love them, you would tell them the truth. Number nine. Ten. It can make others feel guilty but not bending toward it. It questions their love. Mm -hmm. Nobody loves me. No. Do they really care? No. And if so, why are they allowing me to go through this? God don't love me. Mm -hmm. Now you're hating God. He's the bad one. Mm -hmm. This is how the enemy does. He twists it mm -hmm. to get you to think the way he wants you to think. Mm -hmm. The next one. It always close to anger and may erupt at any time. Number 11, yes. self-pity always has a place to blame. It has to find out whose fault it is, yeah. yet it is never their own. Oh, it's that. always you. Right. It's never them. The last one, it always has a reason why we cannot overcome a person with self-pity may say, you just don't understand. Right. Oh, yes, we understand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we know. Oh, it's true. <laughs> oh, we know. Oh, it's true. <laughs> when we assess ourselves and our circumstances as though God is not our gracious Father, we take God out of the picture we turn to ourselves for love and pity. When we believe there are gaps in God's love and we use our circumstances as proof, we tend to take action to fill in those gaps with self-love or self-pity. At any time, we are focused on ourselves other than self-examination. That's what you need to be focusing on. Self-examination leads to repentance. How do I know that? Because my Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 28, he will lead us into repentance. Yes. He also said in 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 5, that he will let every man examine himself. And he's not just talking about when you're taking communion, when you're taking the blood, when you're eating the bread. He's talking about life itself. Because some of us take that scripture only during the time of communion, and we leave out all the rest of the days. And as I can remember, communion is only once a month in the church. So you mean to tell me 12 times you examine yourself? <laughs> Think about that. I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> Again, the only time we need to be lead, led to repentance is when we are in the territory of the flesh. Our sinful flesh is in the enemy of the spirit. And that's Romans 8, the 7th chapter. Write that down. Romans 8, the 7th chapter. When we surrender our lives to Christ, our old nature is crucified with him. Yes. Yes. When we surrender ourselves, our old nature is crucified in him. And you will find that in Galatians, the second chapter, verse 20. That's Galatians, the second chapter, verse 20. And you also find it in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 6. That's Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 6. 
the selfish sin, the selfish sinful part of our life no longer need to dominate. When self is dominated, God is not. We, in effect, have become our own God. Wow. Now you have stepped into another area. Wow. I want to give one example in the Bible. When I was studying this teaching, it hit me. It really hit me because I had to examine myself. If there's self-pity going on here, I really had to examine myself. And I didn't realize how serious this self-pity spirit can be. And I want to read this scripture in 1 Kings, the 21st chapter, verse 4. And my brother Randy read it earlier today. Ahab, and I'm doing perfect, not verbatim, but Ahab converted a vineyard belonging to Nabal and wanted to buy it when Nabal refused to sell it. Ahab went home sad and angry, murmuring, complaining, self-pity spirit. He laid on his bed and refused to eat. He was sad, he was pitiful, yeah. and he was mad. Yeah. But he had a wife that he know that can handle that situation. <laughs> he went pouting to his wife. The Jezebel, the evil Jezebel, yeah. she set in motion a plan to have neighbors murder. You'll find that in 1 Kings, the 21st chapter, verse 15 through 16. What am I saying about this? It may sound funny, but there's something very cynical there. Mm -hmm. Self-pity will draw you into their well. Yeah. Have you to think the way that they think and feel sorry about them, and you can cause yourself to even be murdered to that extent. Wow. Mm -hmm. Self-pity, this is what happened. Ahab went home with his self pityness to his wife, and she made sure that she had this man hit, killed. So be careful when someone come to you and tell you anything, I'm hurting, he did this, they did that. Be very careful. Because your feelings of how you feel about that person, it can go another way. That's right. That's it. When we indulge in self-pity, we have elevated our importance in our own eyes. Romans the 12th chapter verse 3 says, that's Romans the 12th chapter verse 3 says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Let every man examine himself. We are thinking too highly of ourselves when we allow life hurts and injustices to dictate our emotional state. Bitterness can quickly override the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When self-pity come in, the Holy Spirit moves. It's gone. It becomes self-pity now. This is what's happening. The, I'm reminded in Job, when Job said, that very thing that I fear came upon me. And a lot of times we read that scripture and we stop at came upon me. But if you read down further, it said it entered him. It entered. So when that thing began to enter you, it began to resonate, and that's who you become. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that scripture to support the bitterness can quickly override the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And also Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22. That's Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22. It talks about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That should be dominating the life of every believer. Amen. First, Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 18 through 19. That's first Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 18 through 19. And it tells us that we are not to quench the Holy Spirit. Amen. Instead, we are to give thanks in everything. Yes, Lord. It is impossible to give thanks while clinging to self-pity. Mm -hmm. Because by definition, a self-indulgent attitude is not focused on gratitude to others. 
Self-pity cannot be thankful at all for what God has allowed. Yeah. The cure for self-pity begins with understanding just how pitiful self-pity really is. Yes. <laughs> and let me say that one more time. The cure for self-pity begins with understanding just how pitiful self-pity really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pitiful because it's powerless. Yeah. Our own pity for ourselves may conjure up some sympathy from the sympathizer, especially those prone to feeling sorry for others. But it cannot ultimately do anything beyond feeling bad. Self-pity may succeed in winning attention and help from others, but it cannot provide healing. Only God can do that. The Holy Spirit, the root of that. So how to overcome the spirit? Number one, ask God for help. Luke the 11th chapter verse nine, that's Luke the 11th chapter verse nine says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Ask and it shall be given unto you. And what I have learned, what you speak, you must believe. What you read, you must believe. Because a lot of times we read it, but we don't believe what we read. It doesn't resonate in our spirit. The word got to come alive. I'm reminded of David when he said he had to encourage himself. So if you got to encourage yourself, you got to know the word of God. You got to understand what the word of God is saying in order to encourage yourself. If you don't have it on the inside, how are you going to encourage yourself? Self-pity, like most sins, and I'm still on number one, is an expression of pride. It's an expression of pride. It is typically hard to let go of because we must admit our wrong when we have felt in the right. It's okay to ask for help if you need help. The enemy wants you to bear this all alone, but you cannot do it all alone. But you got to know the right people to connect with as well. There's a difference. Number two, repent to God for the sin of self-pity. Yes. Repent. The Bible says in Matthews, the third chapter, verse two, and Revelation, the second chapter, verse five, it's a sin. It is to be killed and tossed away. None shall be settling in you. It all should be gone. It's dangerous. Number three, repent to those affected by your sin or self-pity. The Bible says in James, the fifth chapter, verse 16. That's James, the fifth chapter, verse 16. Confessing your faults one to another. Frequently, this step of self-humbling is where the whole of self-pity is broken. Where you can go and say, I'm sorry. Yes. Forgive me for doing this. Yes. This is where it all begins. Amen. And number four. Ask God to give you the faith to face what you don't want to face. Because a lot of times we don't want to face it. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse six through seven. And that's Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse six through seven. Making your request known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Dropping down to verse 19, and Philippians, the fourth chapter says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He'll supply all your needs. He didn't say some. He didn't say half. He said all your needs according to his riches and glory. And this is why I said we got to remember and we got to believe the word of God. Yes. If he said it, believe it. Amen. If you feel self-pity over facing 
a frightening or unpleasant situation and you feel overwhelmed, ask God to give you the grace to deal with that. Our natural response is self-protection, which often results in self-pity. However, we can choose to walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desire of the flesh. And you find that in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 16. That's Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 16. We can refuse to indulge our sin natures and choose instead a grateful heart, trusting that it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And that is in Philippians, the second chapter, verse 13. That's Philippians, the second chapter, verse 13. We can look at every opportunity to indulge in self-pity as chances to defeat that old nature. That old nature got to be put to death. We can choose instead to trust that God will work everything for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And you will find that scripture in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 28. That's Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 28. And I'm moving right along. I won't be long. But I want to say this. There is not one circumstance of our lives that has not passed through his sovereign love for us. Jesus loved you today, and he cares about you. He has already paid the price for us. Already paid it. And it's for us to walk in it. You have a choice today. Choose you. Who did she choose you this day? Who you will serve? Do you believe the living God? Do you believe his words? Self-pity do not have to take control over you. You are in control. The devil wants you to stay in the same shape that you are in. And let me just say this. There's work to be done. Amen. And he knows that you are a threat to his kingdom. Amen. And if he can get you to bow down to self-pity, he would do it. Amen. So it's time to rise up, take your position, and begin to do the work of the Lord because God got work for us to do today. Amen? Amen. So stand before your feet. And I want to bless you before my husband comes. And I just want to speak a steadfast prayer in your life. And you can repeat after me. Because I wanted to get in your spirit. Lord, please help me to serve you. With undivided attention. And let me faithfully direct my praise. And prayers towards you always. Help me to remain consistent with you. Throughout the days of my life. Throughout the days of my life. Father, Father, please keep my feet firm and steadfast. Please keep my feet firm and steadfast. Do not let me become complacent with your word. Do not let me become complacent with your word. But help me to abide by your instructions. So that I can prosper. So that I can prosper. Give me the gift of the discerning of the spirit. So I can hold firm to the truth always. So I can hold firm to the truth always. Almighty God, Almighty God, please teach me now, please teach me now how, to love, how to love and fear you always. And fear you always. Let me apply your fear, Let me apply your fear to, whatever I do, to whatever I do so that I can prosper. So that I can prosper. Assist me to overcome temptation. And energize me to do works. And energize me to do works. Works of righteousness. Works of righteousness. So that I can enjoy your benefits. So that I can enjoy your benefits. Father, Father, help me to genuinely, help me genuinely repent from my sins. Repent from my sins. And empower me, and empower me to improve my relationship with you. To Anoint me with grace to spend the rest of my life in a way that satisfies you. Let me walk uprightly before you. 
and that your Holy Spirit richly dwell in me. Father, please give me your strength to remain steadfast. Enable me to keep irresistible faith in the time of persecution. Strengthen my mind not to fall into Satan trap. Persecution, adversities, adversities, loneliness, or landmines, attacks, attacks that may come against, against me. Count me worthy today to receive from you all that you have for me, including my deliverance in Jesus' holy name. chapter 22 verse 28 thou shalt decree a thing in the shall what? Yes. Yes. Shall what? Yes. Yes. Come to pass. Okay? I'm going to let you just sit at this time but I want you to, you to decree loudly. We, we want to affect the atmosphere with the enemy. Okay? Say in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I loose upon Satan's headquarters. I loose upon Satan's headquarters. His stronghold. His stronghold. His orders. His orders. His plans. His plans. His curses. Curses. The curse of the Midianites. The curse of the Midianites. The curse of the Ammonites. The curse of the Ammonites. The curse of the Moabites. The curse of the Moabites. The curse of the Edomites. The curse of the Edomites. Let panic. Frustration, 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 havoc, havoc confusion, confusion, say it loud, pandemonium, pandemonium disaster, disaster, chaos, chaos destruction, destruction upon each other. Upon each other. Let there be civil war. Let there be civil war in the satanic kingdom. In the satanic kingdom. Let the demons fight against each other. Let the demons fight against each other. Oh my God. Woo! Oh, come on, get you to play. Let the hornets of the Lord descend upon them. And bring disaster. And bring disaster. May the wrath. May the wrath. Hatred, hatred, anger, anger, terror, terror, fear, fear. Put your finger in heaven. Finger of God. Finger of God. 
The burning judgment. The burning judgment. Pouring angel spirits. Pouring angel spirits. And the word of God. And the word of God. Prevent Satan's order. From being carried out. From being carried out. The perfect will of God. And the perfect will of God. For this assembly. For this assembly. Will be done. Will be done. We ask that all the demonic strong men. We ask all the demonic strong men. Who rule in our churches. Who rule in our churches. Geographical location. Be replaced with agape love. Ask Father in the name of Jesus. All vicious murdering spirits be bound. And those who hate us. So Father in the name of Jesus. We ask you to lose holy angels. Find our mouth. Fire out. Fight in the heaven. Let them guard us from Satan. And all his demonic hosts will believe in life. Give Jesus a hand, bro. First of all, Jesus Christ has the preeminence. Yes, right. He's superior. He's yes, first yes. rank. Yes. First in time. First in place. First in order. Jesus Christ. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Correct. Amen. Okay. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16. That's the book of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16. In the book of Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16, coming from the King James Bible, the Bible says, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Mm -hmm. Is that good? Let me read that again. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall do what? Remain in the congregation of the dead. I want you to shout to the enemy. We are not the congregation of the dead. We are not the congregation of the dead. We are the congregation of the living. We are the congregation of the living. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7. I know it by heart. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Principal thing. But in all that getting, get what? Understanding. Understanding. Oh. You know the Bible has all the vitamins and minerals we need for eternal life. Is that right? Amen. All right. All right, let's get started. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Let's look at verse 3. The book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3. The book of Revelation promises blessings to those who read it. So we want to believe by faith tonight that you're going to read it, and guess what? Promised blessings await you. Okay? In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3 of the King James, the Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth. There it is. Blessed is he that what? Readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Okay? Let's look at the book of Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at verse 13. The book of Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at verse 13. The Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Our Lord promises blessings to those who die in the Lord. Now, isn't that powerful? Yes. How many of you want to die in the Lord? Yes. How many of you don't want to die? <laughs> okay? All right, but it's going to happen to every one of us one day. And we want to make sure we die in the Lord. Is that right? Yes. And rest from their labors and suffering because heaven awaits them. Let's look at the book of Revelation chapter 16. Let's look at verse 15. 
the book of Revelation chapter 16. Let's look at verse 15. In verse 15 of the King James Version, some of you are still turning. I'm going to slow down. Okay. In the book of Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed, here's the blessing again. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they what? See his shame. Blessed is he that watcheth. Every one of you are prophetic watchmen. Every one of you. So the Lord says that we are blessed if we watch and do what? Maintain our thumb. Is that right? Yes. I got a whole scripture for you tonight. All right. Turn to the book of Luke chapter 21. Let's look at verse 36. The book of St. Luke chapter 21. Let's look at verse 36. How many of you, how many of you love God's word? Amen. Okay. Look what it says in verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always. I believe the Lord is speaking to many of us tonight. He's speaking to myself. He started with me and he's speaking to you. Watch ye therefore and pray what? Always. Not five minutes. Not ten minutes. Hello, saints. Always. That ye may be accounted worthy to escape. Oh, my goodness. Well, brother, when the rapture comes, I'm, I am in the first look. <coughs> well, brother, the Bible says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape yes, amen. those things, the word says, that shall come to pass and stand before, before the Son of Man. The Greek word for watch is to be sleepless, to keep awake to watch, to be circumspect, to be attentive. I love this word, to be ready. Amen. Isn't that good? Our prayer is that our family, ourselves, our friends, that we all be accounted worthy to escape. Yes, I don't want my, my, my nephews, my, our nieces, my sister, my brothers, my next of my next of kid, and even many of you who I love with a God pay love. I want to see that you are able to escape those things that are coming to pass on the face of this earth. Now that's the mentality and the mindset that we must have. That's right. Is that right? Yes. I hear people say, well, well, brother, I'm waiting on the rapture. Well, okay, the, the Greek word parousia, the snatching away, okay, okay. But to me, some people have a fatalist mentality. In other words, I only care about myself. I don't care about you. Because I'm going out on the first load. And I hear people talk like that. And it's very heartbreaking. I should be, we should be concerned about each other. Hmm? You know, I want all of us to go out on the first load. Yeah. If that's the type of doctrine that's acceptable. Is that right? But I know the Bible says that we must pray and watch that we may be counted worthy to what? To escape. All right. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 1. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. The book of Revelation chapter 1. Let's look at verse 10 and 11. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of what? A trumpet. Is that right? And verse 11 said, says, I am who? Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest write in the book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Is that right? Yes. The first church is the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was a church that had abounded in the love of Christ. The next church is to Pergamos, or the church of Pergamon, or Pergamos, is a different type of pronunciation. Is that right? The church of Pergamos was a compromising church. 
Okay? Now to the church of Tyre. This was a church that followed false prophets. Okay? The church of Sardis was a dead church. Spiritually dead. Okay? The church of Philadelphia, they, uh, they will pay patiently and do a trial. The church at Laodicea, and many of you already know, they were what? A lukewarm church. Is that correct? So John had a vision of the seven churches of Asia. I want to use as a subject the, the ancient spirit of Pergamos, of Pergamos. That's our subject. The ancient spirit of Pergamos or Pergamos. The church of Pergamos was a church where Satan had a throne. The church of Pergamos was also called Satan's seat. How many of you are listening to me? Is that right? Each one of those seven churches represent the condition of our present day church. Okay? Church of Pergamos, uh, what had happened there, there, there was an ancient spirit looming around, correction, there is an ancient spirit of, 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 uh, of Pergamos looming around our modern day churches today. Not only around, but within many of our churches today. And many of you might say, well, brother, how can that be when that happened so many centuries ago? Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 through 10. Now, I want you to know when you first come up here to stand and minister, you come up on the tag. Okay? So you have to keep pressing in until you get your breakthrough with it. Okay? Amen. All right. I can see this was happening with me, but I'm going to get it together. By any means necessary for Jesus. Okay? Amen. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. It says, the thing that has been, it is that which will be again. And what which has been done is that which will be what? Done again. And there is nothing new under the sun. Isn't that beautiful? Look at verse 10. Is there a thing of which it may be already said, see, this is new. It has already been in the vast ages of time, recorded or unrecorded, which were before. What happened at Pergamos is happening today in many of our modern day churches, okay? Turn with me to the book of Revelation. Let's look at the book of Revelation chapter two, okay? Let's start reading at verse 12 through 17. And that's a summary of our message right here. Verses 12 through 17. Verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things which he have the sharp sword with two edges. He that hath the sharp sword with two edges. Verse 13, I know thy works. This is Jesus speaking, red letter writing. He's speaking to the church at Pergamos. I, he's telling the church, I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Mm -hmm. Isn't there something? Mm -hmm. Jesus is telling the church at Pergamos, I even know where Satan is position. Okay? Mm -hmm. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Look at verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Look at verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which those things which I hate. Is that right? Now look what Jesus said. There's certain doctrines that are, that are manifesting in our churches, he hate them. But Jesus don't hate. Yes, he do. He ain't those doctrines. Is that right? Yes. Look at look at verse 16. Repent. Yes. Repent. Repent, or else I will come upon thee and will fight against them with the sword of my what? Of my mouth. Is that right? Now let, look at verse 17, the last verse here. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the what? Church. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone. He will give him a what? A white stone. 
Here's my white stone here. It came from the island of Pat, Isle of Patmos, off, off the Isle of Crete. Take, we'll talk about that a little later. Anyway. Then he says, I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving what? He himself. Now let's go back to verse 12. The Bible says to the angel of the church in Pergamos. Now, the word angel comes from the Greek word angelos. What does that mean? By implication, it means that Jesus is addressing the messenger angel at Pergamos. He's ad addressing the headship. He's addressing the leadership. Is it safe for me to say that he's addressing the pastor there? Okay. All right. And or, or the head of the church. So we see that, not only that, we see that Jesus understands the protocol. That's right. Because he starts out by doing what? Addressing the headship or addressing the leadership. Yeah. There are many believers that don't know how to obey protocol. Mm -hmm. I've seen people come into God's house, don't, don't obey the law of the house, and they come in there and try to take over because they don't understand protocol. Okay. Is that right? Jesus speaks and addresses the ministerial leadership of Pergamos firsthand. Now this is a lesson for many of us. Is that right? We see many ministries, you let anybody come to your, your church and you disrupt the church. Is that right? When we were pastoring in, in Florida, I can remember two, I called them vagabond prophets or itinerant prophets. Okay, they, they, they answered to nobody's authority. They came into church and they kind of yelled at me, I have a word for this church. You know, and first of all, sir, who are you? Identify yourself. You know, we don't know you. Who are you? And then, and they yelled back at me and I told them again, humbly, that we have some prophetic people. Let them hear that prophetic word let, and let them discern it before, before I let you release it here. Okay? So they snapped at me again. And I said, well, in Galatians 5, temperance and self-control, evidently you prophets don't have no self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. So what I'm going to have to do is ask you to leave, and they refuse to leave. So I said, well, my next step for you is to call the sheriff's office and escort you off the property. <coughs> okay? I was going to give them a chance to, to release that word. I didn't know if they were bound by witchcraft or, or, or what was the case. But I was trying to be meek enough to give them what? Give them a chance. All right? Now, look at verse 12 again. Jesus identified his character title. Look, look what Jesus said. He that have a sharp sword with what? Two edges. He is what? How many teachers are here? He is a personal pronoun. Is that correct, teacher? <laughs> personal pronoun. He is a personal pronoun identifying himself and name. Jesus is telling us that another name that he has is he that has a sharp sword with two edges. <laughs> but brother, he's the root and offspring of David. He's the bright and morning star. Come on, he's the lily of the valley. He's also he that has a sharp sword with what? Two edges. What's your name, Jesus? He that has a sharp sword with two edges. This is good. I'm getting a little word. All right. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Let's look at verse 16. The book of Revelation, chapter 1. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says that he had in his right hand seven stars. Seven stars. And out of his mouth was a sharp two edged sword. When Jesus speaks, his words cut. I think Sister Jerry said that the other day, that when Jesus opened his mouth, something gets cut. Amen. Is that right? I believe that we're getting ready to, we're stepping into a season where God will send messengers into the house of the Lord, and their words are going to cut on both sides. Amen. Look what it says here, out of his mouth with a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun that shines foot in his strength. Now, what were the seven stars? Everybody ready? Look at verse 20. The book of Revelation identifies itself in verse 20 about the seven stars. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. There it is. Is that right? 
And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are what? Are the seven churches. All right. The sharp sword with two edges is applicable today for our present day Pergamos churches. Come on, saints. We need to stop having teachers with itching ears. Is that right? It's time to listen that Jesus released the sword of his mouth That's right. and be a double-edged sword yeah. and cut and cause things to what? Shake themselves in order. How many of you listening to me here? Our Lord Jesus Christ is visiting the churches that need to be cut with the sword of his mouth. Mm -hmm. Flesh, soul, and spirit must now be dealt with. How many of you are listening to me? That's right. Flesh, soul, and spirit, game time is over. Flesh, soul, and spirit, we're in that season where it must be dealt with with the Word of God. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 19. The book of Revelation chapter 19, let's look at verse 15. In the book of Re Revelation chapter 19, look at verse 15. It tells us something about Jesus. Out of his mouth, here's Jesus again, go off a sharp sword. That with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. What does the word smite mean? In the Greek, it means afflict and strike the nations. Hello, saints of God. I hear so many people say, well, he's just a little baby in the manger. Well, saints, I have news for you. He's a man child now. Yes. And when he comes back, he's coming back with a two-edged sword in his mouth, and he's going to smite and afflict the nations. Yes. Listen, he's not coming to do damage control. He's coming to do damage. Yes. Come on, saints. We made him out of a little, a little, little lamb. Oh, he just mm. little lovable and so sweet. <laughs> you keep living in disobedience and you didn't see what happens. How many of you listening to me? How many of you listening to me? Yes. Smite, afflict, strike the nation. The people don't get angry because out of his mouth goes what? Bam! A sharp yes. Yes. All right. Let's look at the book of Revelation chapter 2 again. Let's look at verse 13. The book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. He says, I know thy works. <clears throat> Jesus knew all about the church. Nothing is hid from his eyes. How many of you listen to me? Jesus knew about the church intimately and what they face, and we and we can see that in Scripture. How many of you know the eyes of the Lord run to and fro the whole earth? Amen. Is that right? Yes. Daniel said that God is a God of secrets. Mm. Is that right? Yes, There's nothing that's hid from Him. Many times our flesh tells us, "Well, won't nobody see you? You just go ahead and do it." Then nobody know. Oh, excuse me. Ecclesiastes 5 says there's a recording angel that records every, your movements and everything that you do. He documents it. God sees everything. Even here in Lake Hamlet, he knows your, about your marriage. He knows about your business. He knows about your home. Hello, saint. He knows about your boyfriend. He knows about your girlfriend. Hello, saints of God. And he knows those little secret things you're doing that you think mom and daddy don't know anything. Isn't that good? All right. So he, so he's a, we serve a God who knows everything, and even each and every one of you sitting here in Lake Hamilton and Bobby. All right. He knows the hidden secrets of the home. He knows those who lack understanding. There's nothing hid from our God that he does not what? He knows. All right. Let's keep moving. Look what it says in verse 13. 